something happens and you can't change it, change how you feel about it. Don't try and do huge great things to change your life if you're unhappy. Do small things consistently. The only risk in life is not to take the risk. Hi everyone, we are joined today by someone that I've met and now consider a friend and it is the wonderful Andrea McLean. Andrea is now a number one Sunday Times best-selling author. She's written three books. We know her from Loose Women. She's a journalist, she's a CEO and she has her own female empowerment site called This Girl Is On Fire. And I'm all about mastering your mindset. And I know that you told a story that it was actually someone else's mindset that led you into writing one of your books. So welcome, Andrea. And um, I'd love to hear that story about someone else's mindset influencing you to do something powerful. Oh, well, first of all, thank you so much for, for having me. It's, it's wonderful to be interviewed by you, Marissa. Huge, huge admirer of, of everything that you do and the, the changes that you make to so many lives all the way around the world. Um, in terms of, oh gosh, changing mindset, for me, it's interesting that, that you can pinpoint one moment for me. For me, I can see a thousand people in front of me that I know I've, I've been influenced in, in some sort of way. But in terms of pivoting moments of changing my mindset, I would say actually it's something that I instinctively managed to flip around in my own head from when I was very little. And I know that at various points in my life, there've been people who've, who've come in and out and have made me see things differently at that moment when I needed them to. But it was something that, that I managed to do when I was little. And I'll, I'll, I'll give you an example. Um, I grew up in the Caribbean, in the West Indies, which is quite an unusual thing for a a girl from Glasgow to do, but that, that was that was my upbringing. And I can remember way back then, and I'd, I'd hurt myself. I can't remember what I'd done. I'd fallen over or, or done something. And I remember even as a small girl thinking, this is just a little moment in time. And all I need to do is breathe through this moment. And I started teaching myself how to count to 10. And I must have been about nine or 10 at, at the time. And if I can get through to the end of this time, this moment of pain will have ended. And I won't even remember it in 10 minutes. And it was something that I did without no one even telling me how to, how to do this. And it, I remember it coming in so handy at so many useful times in my life when I was experiencing physical pain, you know, you stub your toe or something like that, or mental pain or emotional pain, or just even a difficult moment to tell myself, pivot how you're thinking about this. It's only going to last this long. If you can count to 10, you've got through it. You know, that's great advice because I've worked with many people in prison and it's interesting that the people on remand do actually worse than the people who are sentenced because we can cope with anything when it has an ending. It's a bit like giving birth when they go, this is going to be over in three hours. I think, okay, three hours, right, I can do that. And human beings are not taught enough that if you can see an ending to something, you know, it's like when children are bullied, they just can't often imagine that it will ever end. When people are depressed, they think, oh, I'm going to be like this forever. And it's why they often want to take their life. And if you could just know that if something has an ending, you can cope with it. I think that's what's happened with COVID. People think, oh, well, how much longer is this going to go on? But we've all got so excited here that, oh, lockdown is ending on April the 12th. We, we can go out. And you start to look forward to the ending. And I tell all my clients something called PPP. If it's something to get you, it has to be permanent, it has to be personal, and it has to be all pervasive. And that's the thing with pain, it isn't permanent, it's not actually personal, and it's rarely all pervasive because even when you're, when, if it, when it's bad, it's not going on when you're sleeping. So tell me more about what made you decide to write your book, This Girl Is On Fire. Oh my goodness. Um... It, I just felt like I had to, if that makes sense. I've, I've written since I was, again, very young, um, probably about the age where I first started 
giving myself time limits for, for pain and this sort of thing. Uh, I, and I, I wanted to be a writer from when I was a very young age. And I started off, I would write my sister's bedtime stories and I'd read her them rather than the ones in books because she really enjoyed them. And I've always, I've always journaled um, and I've always managed to find a way to take my personal experiences and sort of publish them. That was how I ended up getting into features journalism. I was a travel writer, first of all. So for me, I've always journaled my experiences. And the, the, the previous books that I've written were very autobiographical about uh, certain moments in my life. And when in 2019, I had a, I had a full breakdown. I experienced uh, burnout. I, I, we call it in this house, it's the year I face planted. It was basically the year it all became too much and I just fell down. And it, any kind of breakdown happens because of many, many, many little things. It doesn't happen because one day you wake up and it's all too much. It, it's because of many little things. And I've been journaling throughout all of, all of this time. So when I found my process of getting better from this time, I wanted to share it with people in the same way that I had done with my previous books. And to me, it kind of made sense to put it all together and write a book about overcoming trauma, overcoming toxic relationships, overcoming uh, burnout and, and breakdown from my own perspective, but also getting all the amazing advice that, that I was lucky enough to, to get because um, I have therapy, I'm, I know many life coaches, I know many mentors, I know healers, I know people like yourself who this is your life's work in, in terms of showing people how they can look at things in a different way. So I put all of that together. And the, real, the reason I called it This Girl Is On Fire is because I'd already been running um, something that was simply an online blog. For the past two years, I ran this little website called thisgirlisonfire.com and I, I was writing for it and getting many journalist friends and even women I didn't know were approaching me and asking to write for it. I'm constantly paying forward brilliant information about health, well-being, mental health, physical health, this sort of thing. So it made sense to encapsulate it all in the name of something I was already so, so in, involved in. And every book, and you know this, Marissa, every book you write is, is it's like having a baby. You know, the writing mm. process is the gestation period and you sit and you're putting it all together. And then you present it to the world and you, you hope the world thinks your baby's beautiful. And this book literally changed my life. The, the response that I got was so overwhelming from 99% women, but there was a small percentage of, of men as well. And the feedback that I got, women were leaving their jobs, leaving their husbands, leaving toxic relationships, um, facing up to things that they've been too, too afraid to face up to before. Because the book pulls no punches. You know, I don't, am I allowed to swear on your Oh, yes, please. I, oh, yes, I okay, love that. Great. But this is why I like it. <laughs> At the very first line of the book is shit happens. Yeah. Get over it. You you cannot expect your life to work out beautifully just because it all seems so unfair and mm. it doesn't. That is not real life. And because of the huge response to the book, I thought long and hard. The global pandemic was happening. The the world had had imploded and and in terms of our, our normal ways of life had so radically changed. And I just thought this is a moment of great change for for the planet and that that's big in itself but i'm a big believer in control what you can control i feel like it's a moment for me where i need to sit down and think am i doing what i really want to do and i realize no um i don't i'd always wanted to sort of make the leap into investing more fully and paying forward all the information that i was you know lucky enough to to get access to and I had always been waiting for this perfect moment and the pandemic and the response to the book showed me there is no such thing as a perfect moment there's only the moment when you decide yeah. and they're way smarter than me that have decided you know this is my plan for 2020 this is what I'm going to do and then the rug was pulled out from under their feet and I thought if people much smarter than me could make these decisions and not know what's happening and, and then be running around waving their arms in the air there's a chapter in my book that's called We're All a Mixture of Shit and Brilliance. And I realized I could be just as shit and just as brilliant as they are. It's all to do with just trying and learning from mistakes. 
So last year I quit my job um, and I left an industry I'd worked in for a quarter of a century and I walked away from working in television and in the entertainment world and fully immersed myself into my business, which is This Girl Is On Fire. And it's been incredible. It's been wonderful. So I read somewhere, I'm not, I must get this right, but I believe how many people want to write a book? So many, and only 8% actually do it, which is an amazing figure out of all the people who wish to write a book, which is a lot. Only 8% actually write a book, get it published. Because it takes some effort, it's a very solitary thing. I mean, I, when I was asked to write my first book, I was only 25 and I couldn't even write it because all I could think was I've got to be at home on my own. And I just couldn't imagine how I could do that. Now I absolutely love writing, but how did you find the discipline? Because I find a lot of people want something and their first thought is it's going to be so hard. It's going to be so icy. It's going to be scary. It's going to be risky. I'm going to leave my job and not have an income. So how did you take action to do something that some people want to do and yet don't do? mostly because they have blocking thoughts about what it's going to take. How did you do it? How did you sit down? My agent used to call it bum on seat. It was sit on the chair <laughs> and write, which sounds so easy. But again, a lot of people can't get their butt on the seat because we have all these fears of, and then we, of course, have like, oh my God, what if nobody likes it? What if it gets terrible reviews? There's a lot of blocks in the way of being a writer. Mm -hmm. It's boring, it's time consuming, there's no guarantee it will get um, work. And what if you do all of that and it gets terrible, terrible reviews? Like I, I know somebody who wrote a book, I won't mention her, and the review was, this book should not be put down lightly, indeed it should be thrown as far away <gasps> from the unfortunate reader as possible. And that's a really horrible review to get. There's also one that says, this book is funny and original, however, the Funny part isn't original, and the original part definitely isn't funny. <laughs> and I read another one that said, once you put this book down, you just can't pick it up again. So <laughs> reviewers can be incredibly mean. But, you know, I, I met someone actually who he said, you know, I wrote a book, it got the worst reviews. And I suddenly realized that I'd been reviewing books all my life, being so mean, so scathing, so cutting, thinking it was funny. And when my book got reviewed like that, I thought, wow, that's what I've been doing. But tell me, with all of that, all of those blocks and fears, how did you do it? Oh, do you know, the reason I'm laughing so, so much is I've had reviews like that about me, but on telly. Um, I've been fortunate enough that I, I've not had reviews like that about my book. But, oh, my goodness, I've had people say, you know, terrible things about me when, sure. I, when I worked on, on TV, and especially when I started sort of, moving up the ranks a little bit and actually hosting full shows. I can remember, and you always remember the critics. I can remember one saying um, that I was the most saccharine, insipid, Pollyanna-like, irritating presenter that had ever graced our screen and that I needed to just be axed, you know, immediately. And this must have been 15, 20 years ago. And I you know, I managed to keep going. And I regularly have had people slag me off and criticize me and, and whether it's they they don't like they don't like how I present, they don't like how I interview. So for me, I've had all that already. And how I managed to overcome that, and, and it wasn't easy at first. Of, of course it's not, and it's still of course it sticks in me, that's why you remember the words, is not to take it personally. Because I just think you don't know me. You you're just you're basing that on assumption. Now I can take an I can take an attack on whether I'm not doing the job very well. But if you're criticizing me, then you don't know me. So, but in terms of the the book side of things, well, one, even though I've spent so long working in in TV and standing on stage and all this sort of stuff, which I love, I genuinely love, and I get such a kick out of it. I literally feel you're like a racing car driver. I love that moment where, you know, you are you have to get the crowd or you can feel them turning and you, you have to rein them back in again or, or whatever. But I'm actually quite an introverted person and I'm very shy. I like my own company and I actually love the solitude of being on my own and, and writing. And for me, all my, all my books, and I'm, I'm actually currently working on my fourth book, um, they 
They don't start with the idea of this is going to knock it out of the park. This is going to be a Sunday Times bestseller. This is going to be amazing. It starts with something that it feels more like a need rather than a, a goal. And so because of that, it, they norm, it normally starts very, very small and, and gradually builds layer upon layer. And I think if you write a book or if you do anything, if you write a play or, or launch, launch a business, thinking this is going to smash it. Now, of course, you want it to do well. It'd be pretty stupid if you did anything with no goal in mind. I'm really glad that you loved it because you can only be good doing what you love, but still being a writer requires discipline. You have to spend hours writing when all your friends are going out for lunch and hanging out. So did you love it so much it fulfilled you or did you have to have the discipline to sit on the chair and churn it out? I think... What, what's interesting is, although the, the jobs that I've done throughout my life, you know, TV presenting, hosting events and all this sort of thing, are actually very, they're very extrovert. And they really do feed into that side of me, because I like to think that, you know, we're all a mixture of sort of sun and moon, if, if you like. And I, I really enjoy that. But actually, at my core, I'm quite an introvert. And I, I love the process of sitting by myself. So although, you know, I'm now working on my, on my fourth book, with, with every book that I write, they start off very small and they also start off with something that I feel not just a want to do, but a need to do. So, for example, if, if someone, everyone says, oh, I've got a book in me, everyone's got a book in me, everyone's got a book in them, um, just start making notes. Just start writing things down. You know, my, um, my last two books, I wrote so much of it in the notes section of my phone because back, back in the time, obviously, when we were getting trains, tubes, taxis everywhere, sitting backstage waiting to do things, something would occur to me and I'd write it down. And I wrote tens of thousands of words, either in notebooks or on my phone on train. You don't necessarily have to do it sitting in one spot in front of a laptop. Let let it come to you whenever it whenever it comes mm. to you but obviously when you're at that the putting it all together stage you know and you're writing a 80 100 000, um word thing the, there is a discipline involved but make it a really lovely routine so for me i like to write where i can see out of the window um, I actually finished my last book in lockdown and the whole family were there. So my normal space where I like to work, which is in the kitchen, was overrun with children homeschooling and Nick was here and the dog and everything else. And so I dragged the laundry basket in from the hall, put it in, in our bedroom under the window. And I sat on a, on this poof Ottoman thing, hunched over the laundry basket. But I made it my own space. I mm. have I have candles. I'm, I'm quite woo woo. I like all this sort of stuff. I have lovely crystals that are my favorite thing. And every day I sat down, lit a candle so it smelled nice, and just got stuck in. And it's about yes, setting a routine, but not in a really boring way, so that it it feels like a, a chore. Try and reframe it in your head. What an exciting thing. I'm mm. going to sit here and write my book. It doesn't matter that I'm hunched over a laundry basket and I can hear kids. I literally, you know, these little headphones. Put your headphones in. Listen to music or the radio or whatever. For me, I like, I work really well with classical piano music because it just starts to, and I almost type as if I'm playing the piano. I can't play the piano. I, I can play the piano really badly. Um, and it just, I, I kind of work to a rhythm. It's finding whatever works to you. But if you see it as this great big mountain, it's, it's going to seem too big. So break yeah. it all down into little pieces. I find that too. I, I hypnotize a lot of people who want to write books. It's why I wrote. I, I hypnotized this very successful journalist who got writer's block to write. And he wrote such a bestseller. I thought, wow, I should actually do that too. And I know when I wrote my first book, I would always think it's a bit like a child drawing a picture they start off with a little tree and then they do a house and it comes together. So when you are writing a book, you don't have to start with the beginning. Is the beginning, I'm going to write through to the end. You can start in the middle. You can start with the um, dedication. You can start anywhere you like. It's rather like painting. You just have to start because so many people have this weird belief. I'm just waiting for Mr. Motivator or Miss Motivator to appear. And when I'm motivated, I'll write. And it's like, no, no, no. 
motivation appears when you begin. Motivation isn't not going to go, hey, I'm here now. Finally, I've turned up to help you write that book, start that website, whatever you're going to do, start the diet. Yeah, I'm, I'm, motivation has turned up, let's go. It's when you begin that you become motivated. I'd often come in in an evening with my first book or second book and think, I just think I'll do half an hour before I go to bed. And I'd sit down and five hours later, I was still there. I'd often get up and think, I'm not in the mood today. Why don't I just do spell check and look at the font and I'll do the dedications. That's the fun bit. I just go through it. And, and, but of course, once you start, motivation comes starting. When you take action, you become motivated. Like I don't always want to go to the gym. I definitely don't want to clean out my closet, but when I begin, I said, oh, I'll do a bit more now. I'm in the mood. So you have to start. You have to take action to become motivated. And when you're waiting for motivation, you wait a long time. People say to me, hey, I had an idea for that very book you wrote, and I kept meaning to do it, and then you did it, and now I can't take that book to market. But that's just because I had to make myself motivated. And I see so many clients who miss the boat because they're always waiting. And then the second thing is people have this fear of risk. And here's the truth. The only risk in life is not to take the risk. I loved Wayne Dyer. I met him many times and he said something to me that I never forgot. He said, don't die with your music still inside you. And I thought that's such a beautiful thing. Many of us do that. We, our life passed away. We think, well, I never, I wanted to do that. And I didn't do it because I was waiting. I couldn't find the time. Well, nobody finds time. You have to go out and use the time you've got. But there is no risk in life except not taking the risk. So I'm really pleased that you just, lovely that you loved it. But what I also find is when you don't love it, oh God, I don't want to do that. You actually often begin to love it. Taking action often is followed by, wow, I didn't even want to do this. And now really getting into it, but you loved it in advance, which is great. So would you share with us some of your, I know you have a lot of pointers, a lot of hints, a lot of tips, but I'd love you to share a couple with us right now because I know our audience would love that. Oh, that's so kind. I mean, in, in terms of, um, you know, each one of the books that I've written is different, but the, there's been a very similar theme, which is taking your own personal experience and showing people how this is the problem I had, this is my reaction to it, and this is how I overcame it. Now, that sounds super easy and, and straightforward in that all I do is walk around sort of batting off problems like some kind of Marvel character because I, I don't. You know, I curl up in a ball and cry just like everybody else does. Um, but for me, I suppose it comes down to three key things. The first is try and think differently. And, and what I mean by that is, is shift your perspective on, on the, the issue that is bothering you. Because we all have something that is, that is bothering us. And a, a way to sort of um, demonstrate is, I don't know if you remember years and years, years ago, I can't remember what advert it was for. It was in this country. And the advert showed this really scary looking young man. And he's running like this, a really scary face. He's running towards the camera. And then you, you see it from the side and he's running after a woman and you think, oh my gosh, he's, he's going to mug that woman. And he runs and runs and runs and he shoves her over to the ground. And then the camera pulls back and actually something was falling from a building. And what he was doing was running to save her and push her out of the way. And that really stuck with me. And I think the advert was something like things are not always as they seem. Mm. It might be for a bank or something. I can't remember. But it really stuck in my head in that, if we can think differently and try and shift our perspective on whatever it is that we're, that we're dealing with, there was always another way to look at it. And whenever I'm faced with something, weirdly, I always imagine this scary looking man running. Yeah. I'm thinking, actually, that's like the problem. I'm seeing this as this, this really big scary thing. Actually, if I look at it differently, this could be coming at me for a whole different reason. So that's sort of one example. I hope that helps in some, in some sort of way. Yeah, it does, because what you're saying is what I say to people all the time. It's not what happens, it's how you interpret it. Events affect you, of course they do, but the meaning you attach to an event will affect you so much more. So that 
in COVID, we have people going, oh my God, I'm, I feel like I'm living in Korea now. I'm just in jail. I'm in prison. Look, so I'm actually loving it. I'm actually doing stuff. I always wanted time to myself. So it, it can't be the event. It's how we feel about the event. And how you feel about the event, you're free to change that at any time. It's a bit like when we get dumped and we go, oh my God, that was terrible. And then you go, wow, God, now I look back and think, what a favor. Thank God that idiot dumped me because I met somebody a million times better. Thank God I got fired from that job because who would have thought round the corner was somebody better? But at the time, we can't see that, which is why diaries are very useful. You look back and think, oh, look at me, broken heart about some idiot. And a year later, I was with somebody better, way better. It's it's always very interesting yeah. that, you know, I, I had a miscarriage oh, a long time ago. And, and it was, um, and I, when I had that, I sat down and wrote my book, trying to get pregnant and succeeding. And now I think, wow, actually, wasn't really in my plan to have another baby. I think I was 47 at the time. I'd even been 48. So that even the fact that I got pregnant then was fascinating. And I thought, wow, I should write this book about, you know, how to prolong and extend fertility if you want to. And I look back and even those bad things, that relationship ended, I lost the baby. I don't regret any of that. And I can see all these women all over the world who had babies from that book that I wrote because... I did feel sad and slightly bereft, but I made something good out of it. That probably sounds a bit glib and nauseating, but a lot of people do that. They write books about having cancer or being dumped or being scammed, and they go, yeah, but something amazing has come out of that. I wrote a book. I, I wrote, it became a movie. I, I created a movement. I did something to help other people. And I know Shakespeare said, all art comes from pain. And I thought, that's so true. Nobody says, I'm so blissfully happy. My life's amazing. Let's create a product. It's people who say, you know, I, I know the girl who created period pants, which is such a great thing. But that came from a terrible moment where she was running and her blood was running down her legs into her sock. And she was like, oh, I, how do I deal with this? But she had an idea to create something amazing. So our most painful moments are often our teachers to create something incredible. And I love the fact that you've done that so well. And I love the fact you're giving people advice and your advice would match mine, which is, look, when something happens and you can't change it, change how you feel about it. Do that thing of, is there anything good about it? There's no nothing. No, there is. If you keep looking, there will be something good about it, even though you find that very hard to believe at the time. But there's always something good. And you obviously talked about the menopause. And did, did you have a hysterectomy? And you yeah, talked about yeah. that. And, and so for a lot of people, it's like because people say, oh, after the menopause, you get fat, you get hairs on your chin, you lose your sex drive. It's like, no, that, that simply isn't true. Someone told you that. It's like saying after you have a baby, you get really fat and your time isn't your own, and it's all awful, and you're just this blob, this feeding station. And I wonder why people tell women these things, because there are hundreds of women who've had four babies, look amazing. There are hundreds of thousands of women who've had hysterectomies and look really sexy, and go, oh, actually, I'm, I'm, I'm not worrying about getting pregnant anymore. I feel more sensual now. And yet we feed women this horrible line about, well, it's all going to go downhill. You've got more chance of being abducted by a Martian than finding love at 50. You've got more chance of being run over by a double-decker bus than someone finding you sexy at 55. And it isn't true. Everything that you mentioned there, you, you probably will experience, but there is so much that you can do to mm. kind of wrestle the control back. And I think that, that for forewarned is forearmed and I think just giving people a, advice so that they can plant in their own heads actually I don't need to just take this as in like this is my lot now there's so much that I can do and it's within my control and again actually you, you, you said did I get any more advice it would be control what you can control mm. but there's no point thinking well that's it I'm, I'm going through whether it's the menopause now or it's it's COVID and the pandemic or the, the job situation that you're in. You can't control how horrible your boss is, but you can control how you react to how horrible everyone else is around you. You can't control the fact that your 
going through the menopause as in your, what your body's going through as in it's going to happen, but you can't control how you deal with it. Um, so I think that in itself makes you feel so much better because as humans, we like to feel that we're at least controlling our little bit. The biggest problem is, and I'm sure you find this, is people try and control everything. Mm. And that's where insanity lies because you, you can't. And actually letting it go is a release. Yeah, you realize it's, it's fine. Just let it be what it's going to be. I tell all my clients the truth. Look, the only control in life that you ever have is over your thinking. You can't control anything except your thinking. You can't control traffic. If you control yourself, you'd never get a spot. You'd never get a cold. You wouldn't even get tired. The law of control says when you control your thoughts, it changes your life. And when you make your thoughts positive, it changes everything everything. I mean, it's extraordinary when you can change your thinking. And what's so amazing is that when you start it, you have to make yourself do it. Okay, I'm going to change. I'm not going to go, this is hell. I'm going to go, well, this is a challenge. I'm not going to go, my kid is driving me crazy. I'm going to go, my kid is age appropriate. They all do that. I'm glad my kid's difficult and opinionated because at least I know they won't get bullied or manipulated by some stupid guy when they're 16. But when you start to change what you think about something, it really does change your life. And of course, you have to start by saying, what's good about this? Nothing. No, I'm going to make myself find what is good. I'm going to not think this is difficult. This is awful. Why me? Like I love a living Newton-John who said when she got cancer, she said, well, why not me? Why shouldn't I get it? Every third person now is getting cancer. Why not me? And what could I do that's so good? And I love the fact that she's done so much good, as has Kylie Minogue and Cheryl Crow and so many women who've had cancer, Sharon Osbourne. And here they are, looking fit, looking amazing, looking sexy. And I'm going, yeah, it was a blip. And if you can do that about cancer or being dumped or losing a baby or losing your job, you can actually do it about anything because the law of control says this, your thoughts control your feelings. Your feelings control your actions, your actions control and dictate your behaviors. If you have to peel that backwards, how you think, how you act, how you behave and how you feel all stem from how you think, that's actually great news because your thoughts are yours to change. I thought I wasn't enough, and then I thought, well, why not think I am enough? I thought love isn't available. Why, why did I think that? Because my dad left when I was one. Well, he's an idiot, but I'm not. And somebody wanted me to be here, even if it wasn't him. I thought I should have been a boy, but maybe I was meant to be a girl. And when you can look at your negative thoughts and make them positive, it really does change your life, but not for a bit forever. And for me, the most amazing thing has been changing my thinking and seeing how that changed my life. But even better than that was it started off being what I did, and then it became who I am, and then it became extraordinary. You're so right. And, and I think even if people are, are listening to this or watching this and, and thinking, uh, yeah, but it's all right for you because you're clearly very good at that. I can't do that. And, and, I, and I know that that's the sort of go-to response mm. that so many people have because they're scared. What I remember when I was first offered, for example, the job anchoring Lou Simmons, and I said no to it. I, I thought, well, one, I thought, that's that program with scary shouty ladies, and <laughs> I, don't, I don't want to go there. Um, and my agent at the time said, you're a fool. It's a great show, and they've asked for you, and it's a great opportunity, and you, you need to do it. And I was, I had my baby daughter, uh, it was my second child, she was 12 weeks old. Um, I was still feeding, um, you know, doing night feeds through the night. I had just started back on breakfast television because I'd only taken a short amount of time off because in TV, if you take too much time off, people sure. think you've died and you never get your job back again. So I was already juggling a demanding job that I had to get up half past three in the morning to, to go in to do. And now this opportunity came. And I, I sat and thought about it, and I thought, she's right, it, it is, and I can't not do this just because I don't know how to do it. So every day I went in, and I pretended I was someone who knew what they were doing. Mm. Obviously, I didn't tell everybody this is what I was doing. But I went in, and I thought, right, this is, this is what an anchor would do, and this is, this is how an anchor would react to this. And 
eventually, and it, it took probably a few months, I realized that actually I wasn't pretending anymore. I was genuinely, genuinely reacting as an anchor reacts. I was, uh, it was, it had become a habit because it was something that I was doing so often. And it, it was one day when I realized that actually I'm doing this by myself. I'd almost been a learner driver and I realized everyone else had let go and I was driving myself. Nobody else even knew that I was doing this. I was doing it all inside my own head, but I realized it. And again, no one had taught me how to do it. It's such a useful tool because we're so scared because we think everybody else knows what they're doing. Nobody else knows what they're doing all of the time. They might know what they're doing some of the time. So all you have to do is look at someone who you think is doing something that you want to do really well and do what they're doing. We're all just copying each other. And you see, we all tell ourselves lies. This is going to go all go wrong. It's not working. I'm too stressed. I'm not prepared. And sometimes that's the best thing. I was um, in Croatia two years ago, and I'd just flown in from LA, and I was giving a talk at this event. And they said, could you give another talk? I'm like, sure. Could you give another one? So I did like three talks, and then and I prepared for each one. And on day four, they said, could you do one more? I'm like, oh. I'm so tired. And I said, yeah, whatever. And I thought, you know, I, I now don't care. I'm not going to prepare. I'm really tired. I just, so I just walked on stage. And it actually was the best talk I ever gave because I'd got past that. I didn't even care anymore. I felt they were giving me so much to do. I didn't even have time to get over jet lag. And I thought, well, I'll do it, but I haven't got time to prepare. I haven't got time to practice. I'm just going to go out and speak. And that was such a good lesson to me that sometimes when you don't prepare, it's the best thing ever because you can just be you. Sometimes when you turn up, um, you know, and it's like a bit like with my husband, you know, I just started to date him and I fell in the snow and broke my arm and he drove across London. And, and I mean, I couldn't even put a bra on. He had to do everything for me. He had to like wash my hair and dress me and undress me. And I really fell in love with him then because he was so kind. But you'd think, oh gosh, I'm just dating this guy. I haven't got any makeup on. I haven't got my nice clothes on. I'm just wandering around with an arm in a sling, being completely helpless like a baby. But that's when we fell in love with each other because I realized he was so kind and funny. He would have to give me injections and he always made me laugh. So sometimes the best thing is the worst thing. And sometimes the worst thing ever is the best thing. Like people say to me, I got dumped. I had mascara down here, I was crying, and my neighbor turned up and looked after me. We fell in love, and he saw me at my worst. But I thought, wow, if he sees me at my worst, then okay. And my mother had that. You know, she was in hospital very ill, and her next door neighbor turned up and declared undying love. She looked terrible. She was very beautiful. She looked awful. And she married him almost immediately because. He was there, and we always think it's got to be perfect for love. We've got to be perfect, our house. And we'll say, no, I liked it the most when you were vulnerable. I love coming to your house. It's so messy because it gives me permission to just be me. And I think it's important for women to understand that when you turn up as the best you, you think, oh, people love me because I'm the best. When you turn up as the worst you and people love you, you know that they love you. So you've got to stop trying to show up as your best or groomed and slim with your stomach held in and your kids appear perfect because the basis of all friendship is we choose people who share our vulnerabilities. And when you don't show people any vulnerabilities, they, they really can't connect with you. Mm -hmm. So I have a question for you, and I know you'll be good at answering it. Why do you think women hide their vulnerabilities? Why do you think they pretend everything's fine, everything? Why do you think they suppress who they are and how they feel? Why do you think we do that? Because we do it so much more than men. I think that's such a brilliant question because it's something that I didn't even realize that I did, um, probably until my late, late 40s. Um, I'm, I'm in my fifties now, but it probably wasn't until then. And I realized that I'd spent my whole life trying to be a good girl. And it, it stemmed from, I have, I'm, I have lovely parents. I'm, I'm blessed. My parents are still alive. They live around the corner from me. Um, and we have a great relationship, but they, they're very Scottish 
and very Glaswegian. And uh, my my dad's from the Gorbals in Glasgow. So he had a very he had a very very challenging uh, upbringing. Um, it, that was within his home life and also obviously his surrounding. And he he worked very hard to bring a a really safe, happy, joyous uh, family life to to my my mom and my my sister and I. But in doing that, there were very strict rules in how we how we behaved and and that sort of thing. And I realized there was this little grain that had been sort of sewn in my head, which was you have to be a good girl to get rewarded or to please your parents and to make them make them happy. And I carried that right the way through every relationship I ever had, every job that I ever did, in that I never spoke up when actually I felt that something wasn't right or was was unfair. And I was in some, I've had some horrible relationships and I've had some horrible jobs. Um, but I never had that voice of being able to feel that I could put my hand up and say, actually, everything that you're doing is 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 wrong. It's it's unfair and unjust and, and, and that sort of thing. Not that my dad was ever unfair and unjust. It was just we were raised to be very good girls. But I think coming back to your question, that's where it comes from. Little girls are raised to be good and little boys are raised to just be little boys. Mm. And I think that um, that's something that I really, really hope the next generations don't have. Um, it's if you're fortunate enough, I think, to have parents who just see you as you are and you're allowed to be a messy, loud, rough and tumble girl, and actually you're so lucky because it's, my sister and I laugh about this now, um, it's so difficult for us still. If there is an older gentleman in a suit, we will automatically feel that they're right and we need to listen to what they say. And I have to wrestle that feeling to the ground and think, mm -hmm. one, I'm probably older than you now, and two, you do not know everything you do not know everything you're not right about everything and i think it comes from our upbringing so for me that the sort of how i tried to change that was i have a son and a daughter and i realized actually that uh the differences that they had weren't because they were boy and girl it was because of their personality my son is quieter than my daughter he was neater he was he was more well behaved i suppose my daughter she is loud, messy, rambunctious, and that made for quite challenging times when she was a toddler, but even then, I didn't try and squash it out of her. Yes, she had to learn manners and, uh, you know, boundaries and this sort of thing, but there was this voice in me that I was so happy mm. that she had this fire in her, and I didn't want to squash it out, because exactly like you said, I wanted her to still have that in her, so that if she ever gets that horrible boyfriend who tries to shut her up or say I don't want you dressing like that or what time do you call this or, or whatever I want her to have it in her that she'll say no sod you this is how I am and so I'm hoping that generationally we're we're making those changes but 100% women are it's how we're raised we're too mm. scared to speak up in case yeah shut us down and it isn't just raised by our parents it's how the media look at women the first thing they would look at women like when i do television they go oh i love your top or gosh you look nice they they talk mm. about what you look like rather than what you're saying and um i'm really glad it's changing but it isn't just our parents it's the media it's the internet where you know you and i know that people go on youtube and go oh you look awful but they don't say that to men they go oh yeah that was cool nobody had said yeah. to Pavarotti well you really need to lose a few pounds here they, it women really are judged on what they look like what they do how they age and it used to be that well you know when I get to 70 I can just let it all hang out now we have people like Jane Fonda looking amazing almost aging oh wow it never ends that it pressure ends. and men don't have that pressure they're getting it more yeah. I think Women have always been overexposed to fake images of perfection. We yeah. see women looking amazing. And then we hear things like, um, oh, Carrie Fisher's mom, Debbie Fisher said, you know, I, I was bulimic. I was on slimming pills my whole life. We think it's during the 50s and 60s with the pressure mm -hmm. for women to be like dolls and that whole Stepford wife thing. 
But now I'm seeing a lot of men with anorexia and bulimia because they are now also overexposed to fake images of male perfection that, that aren't real. And I think in some ways it's got worse. I think Instagram and YouTube and all these Facebook images, I think, oh, everyone's got a perfect life. They've got thin thighs and fat hair, but I've got fat thighs and thin hair, so therefore I don't <laughs> count. Yes, you do. It's not your yeah. thighs or your hair or your butt. It doesn't matter. But well, I think while know, it's got Marissa, better... If I, could yeah. just, if I could just give you a most ridiculous example of this that will blow your mind. So a few years ago, I was asked to do an interview uh, and it's because I was promoting a really lovely brand of skincare and uh, I don't lend my name to just anything. I always look into it and think, yeah, this is a brand that I'm happy to align myself with. So it was a day of where it, uh, journalists come in. It was, it, uh, it was in a hotel and they come in. It's like a junket. They come in one after the other and you, you do an interview and uh, the end bit is you talk about skincare. So this young woman comes in <laughs> We're talking about, you know, health, fitness, all this sort of thing. And um, I've been very open in the past because I think it's fair. Uh, when people have said to me, you look, you look lovely, I do genuinely look after my skin. But yes, I've had Botox because I think it's not fair to, for women to say, actually, all of this is just because of some cream. No, I have my dad's frown line and I have, I have Botox here. And I come and go with it. I don't have it all the time. Anyway, this young woman said to me, uh, you've been very open in the past about having Botox. I get asked this every question. In every interview I ever do, it doesn't matter whether I'm talking about I've built a rocket that can now go to Mars and mm -hmm. I beat every man. I would get asked about whether I've had Botox or not. And this young woman said to me, I'm very open about the fact that you've had this. Uh, can I just ask you what you think about vaginal rejuvenation? And I literally was like, what do you mean? And she said, well, obviously you're getting older. And uh, would you ever consider vaginal rejuvenation? I said, are you talking about surgery on my vagina to make it look nicer? And she said, yes. I was so <laughs> blown away that she'd asked me this. But then what really annoyed me afterwards was my politeness instinct took over and I answered her question. I went, well, you know, it's not something I've ever considered, but, you know, it's a, uh, uh, absolutely, if it's something that people feel would serve them, then, then go ahead. But it's not something that I've ever, you know, considered. And she moved on to the next question. When I got home, I was raging. Of course. I was so angry that... I was put in a position where I'm, I'm a woman who is, you know, respected in her industry. I'm bloody good at what I do. I'm, I'm, I'm a writer. I'm a broadcaster. I'm a mother. I'm, I've done all these incredible things. And actually, my existence was brought down to that one moment of, can I talk about what my vagina looks like? <laughs> and I roared about it when I got home. But I was more angry that I had to say yeah. it at the time. But that's that pressure, you see. It's like, you know, I talked to the guy, I need a bikini bridge. I need a thigh gap. I need to design a vagina. It's like, no, no, no. Your grandmother just lifted up her nighty and they had no idea what a perfect vagina was. I mean, how many people actually get to see your labby? I mean, I hope not more than maybe 15 in your life. And I mean, for the one, but do you think they really care? And by the way, while well, we're so busy doing that, what about a scrotum? That's not the best looking thing in the world. No one says, hey, you need to get your scrotum tight. Your testicles are dropping a bit now. I think they should, you should go for a testicle lift. It's so offensive to women that we've got to lift and snip off and take out and inject in stuff. But no one says to guys, you know, that scrotum is probably the ugliest thing in the world. But no one tells guys <laughs> that. But we're told that our labia, it's got so many horrible names for that, which I won't repeat. And that's the media because no husband goes, hey, I don't really think your vagina is beautiful enough. I mean, they wouldn't say that. And if they would, then get rid of them. But that there isn't, every year they invent a new part of a woman's body for them to hate. I found a new bit to hate. I'm going to have my butt bleach next because it doesn't look quite the right color. It's like, but who's down there? I mean, for God's sake, have candle lights, turn the lights off, snipping off the bits of your most sensitive parts of your body in case it doesn't. I mean, people have labia dying now because well, it should be really bright pink. Said who? We're trying to look like Barbie. And I get so cross with, with the media for doing that to women. 
And I would say to my female clients, listen, you've got a perfect ass. You don't need to date one. You, if your person says to you, you need a better vagina, go, listen, God gave me a great ass. I don't need to be married to one. No one needs to in their life. But um, that's the media. That, and that is the media doing that to women, to girls. You've got to, your breast should be up here. You've got to have like a big bum now, but a concave stomach and... I, I really object to what the media are doing to girls because they're making them ill. They make that that's what anorexia is all about, bulimia. I don't conform to an image, but it isn't even real. And you have to retaliate back and go, hey, uh, that's why I love the vagina monologues because it's like, you should be happy. Just be happy. Some people say to me, oh, you know, you're, somebody wrote to me recently and said, I, I watch you on YouTube and someone really needs to tell you how to dress. Stop dressing. You need to dress like an old woman. And I was going to, I didn't respond because there's no point, but I would have said, hey, listen, I don't dress for you. I dress for me. I don't care what you think. And by the way, having had cancer twice, I don't mind getting old because it's better than the alternative. And when I had that, I decided I would never, ever criticize my body. I said to my body, you've got to keep me here for, until I'm 110. I'm not going anywhere. And if my body kept me, I would never, ever go, oh, my God, look at the state of me. I've got a muffin top. My arms aren't toned because we get old, but it's better than the alternative. And it's, I think the culture is so cruel to women, especially in the Western world where we're supposed to look hot when we're 75. I mean, who cares about that? It's actually a great thing when you realize, you know, my grandmother had baggy, saggy arms. And my, I had a very beautiful mother, but my grandmother, her arms were the best place in the world to be. I used to climb into her arms. She was very frumpy and, and fat. And she, to me, and I used to trace all her lines. They were like lace. She was the most beautiful person in the world. And I loved her much more than my beautiful mother in her 60s mini skirts, always dieting, living on yogurts. I think, oh God, my grandmother used to make cakes and soups and pies. And my mother wouldn't even have that stuff in the house. But I remember my grandmother was cooking, doing stuff, um, making jam together. And that was happiness. And I think of my mother on a diet her entire life. And she did look beautiful, but it, it didn't actually make her happy. And we should tell women the truth. It's great to look good. It's great to have shiny hair and a great body, and it's great to feel good. But if that made you happy, why have we got all these supermodels that are miserable? Why have we got people taking their life and being depressed when they look amazing? Because looking amazing is lovely, but I can tell you I have so many supermodels, Victoria's Secret models. My neighbors go, what, why is that person coming to you? I don't tell them, of course, but it's because they never feel enough, even when they look like that. And happiness is from knowing you're enough just the way you are, making the best of yourself, but knowing you are enough, not, <laughs> well, I'll be enough when I look like a supermodel, because if they're not happy and they look like that, why do you think you would be? I think oh, you're so right in what you say. So, so right. And people put a, they put a, you know, I'll be happy when, you know, whether it's lose 10 pounds, have a million pounds. We're always gaining and losing the wrong kind of pounds. Um, you know, that, that sort of thing. And it's funny because I've had so many people say to me, uh, um, you know, since not working in TV, and it's not because I'm not working in TV. I, I love working in, in television. Um, I just didn't, I was ready to make a change. Oh, you look so well. And I genuinely think that it's because it doesn't matter what size you are. It comes down to the whole roll doll thing from the twits. Do you remember those yeah. twits about how if you think ugly thoughts, those ugly thoughts will, will come out through your face and of you course. will end up, you look ugly. But if you think good, kind thoughts, and and you're happy within yourself. It doesn't matter what your face looks like. That will shine out and yeah. be beautiful. And I genuinely believe in that. And I think that Me too. actually the most beautiful people, not just women, but the most beautiful people you see are the ones who are just so at home in themselves. Yeah. It doesn't matter what what how tall or thin or short or round or whatever. There's just a, a there's a that glowing that yeah. out of them. That's what makes them beautiful. I think so too. So Andrea, I'd love to know what are your 
three top tips for mastering your mind. You've done very well, but I'd love you to share if you had to tell someone the three tips that you would have to master their mind, that you've used to master your mind, what would they be? I, I think the first one would be think differently. Mm -hmm. How can I think differently about this situation, whether it is changing your perspective, like I, like I mentioned earlier, or just try and flip it 180 degrees so that you're, you're focusing on the solution rather than the problem. Because so often we're so honed in on what the mm. problem is, we're not thinking about what the possible solutions are. So the, the first thing would be to think differently. The, the second thing, again, I've mentioned it before, would be control what you can control. Stop trying to wrestle your life to the ground and put your foot on its neck and go, right, now everything is working exactly as I want it to do. And, and I see this so often with friends of mine that the whether it's tidying their house so much, they're just trying to control their, their environment so that everything is, is spotless, make their kids or their husband behave in a certain way. That it, and it, it's almost this, if I don't step on the cracks, everything will be fine. Yeah. That beauty is very brittle and it will snap and break. So stop kind of trying to control everything and just control the bits that you can control and actually start with yourself. And what I would say with that is just, let it go. And even that in itself is, is being in control of, 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 of things. It's, it's letting things go. And my third thing would be, don't try and do huge, great things to change your life if you're unhappy. Do small things consistently. Because, again, when we were talking right at the start about writing a book, people think, I want to write a book, but it's, oh my gosh, I can't write 100,000 words. That's massive. Like I say, I wrote a lot of my books in the notes section of my phone just while I was um, on trains and tubes and this sort of thing. And I know the world isn't doing this right now, but we still have moments um, where you can jot little things down and bit by bit, those small consistent things actually build up to a much bigger thing. Whether it's, you know, you don't, you don't brush your teeth for one hour once a week. You brush your teeth twice a day for two minutes. So do five sit-ups if you want a six pack a day and within a month you'll be kind of getting there rather than thinking I'm going to do a hundred and then you do five and feel like a failure and then don't do any more. So it's do small things consistently. I mean, it sounds so silly. I've, I've got my sister doing this now. I do squats while I brush my teeth mm. and I look silly and the kids have got used to me. But by the time I've finished brushing my teeth, I've done 30 squats. That, they're 30 squats I wouldn't have done yeah. at any other time because I'm too busy, but I'm standing still anyway. And I look ridiculous because I'm normally naked and I've just got out of the shower and God help anyone who comes in, but I'm literally doing my squats and then they're done. Yeah, so I actually do. My top yeah. I do a bit of ballet exercises while I'm cooking too because I'm standing at the stove. So I do kind of the, the leg exercises and yeah. I do those sometimes when I'm in a line in a store. I think it's a great idea. As you say, you know, don't wait for that. You can... You can do a few stomach crunches when you're lying on the sofa watching television. You can do some leg lifts. So you're absolutely right. You know, first you make your habits and then your habits make you. And we go, I'm going to go to the gym. When I've, when I've lost 10 pounds, I look good in workout because I go to the gym. I, I do that when, when, when the kids are going to. And you just have to do it now. You know, the, the, you're, you're in the present and so if you want to, as you say, doing working out for five minutes a day gets you in the habit, waking up thinking, okay, you know, I really want cake, but I'm going to eat an apple. I'm going out for lunch and I, I want to have pizza and fries and cake, but I'm actually going to have salad and fruit. And if you do that little change eventually, because after 10 days, you like what you do. You think, oh, actually, no, I like it. When I I used to always drink tea with milk and honey, and I loved it. Now I can't, and then I took the honey out, took the milk out, started to use almond milk. I didn't love it, but I remembered that in ten days this will be normal, and in twenty days it was so normal. I now couldn't imagine ever drinking tea with milk and honey. In fact, it sounds disgusting, but it was my joy and my comfort many times a day. And it's about making a little change. And then keeping it going. And, and I'd like to give a little hint too. When you're making a change, you need to say these magic words. I'm choosing to do this and I'm choosing to go. I'm choosing to do squats while I clean. I'm choosing to do a few crunches while I'm watching. I'm choosing to replace cake with some berries. It's not better, but I'm choosing it 
and choosing to feel great about it, because then your mind goes, oh, you've got a choice. When you go, oh, I don't want to do that, and I don't like the berries, your mind says, oh, you go back to what you want. So you've been an amazing uh, person to talk to because you've given us so much great advice. But for our audience here, remember, don't just take advice, apply it. We all now need to start doing squats while we're cleaning our teeth, a few crunches while we're watching television, and we all need to go, hey, I'm enough. Check out my next video here. And I see all my clients and they all say the same thing. I'm waiting for motivation. You know what? Motivation doesn't go, here I am. I'm motivation. I'm at your door and I've come to motivate you. You are firing new neurons. The mind